Well, hi, everyone, from wherever you're watching and listening, and welcome to the lockdown edition of VLGA Connect Summer Series Newsroom with Catherine Arndt, the CEO of the VLGA. How are you feeling, Catherine? I'm feeling okay, Chris, even though we are, unfortunately, all of us here in Victoria in another lockdown situation. So I guess on behalf of the VLGA, just sending out our, our thoughts to everyone and hope that you're holding up in this yet another lockdown. Um, remote learning for students, of course, has started again today. I know there are a few kids out there, I'm sure, feeling a little sad and discombobulated by that, as, as I think we adults are as well. However, if um, this does help us get on top of what could, of course, be so much worse than it is, then I think um, we're all ready and able to do what we have to. We've been here before. We've done this before. It's only five days. I reckon we've got, Catherine, I, I do want to share something with you that I was reading over the weekend, um, because I think there's a lot more discussion about the impact on people's mental health this time around, and, and young people in particular. And I think, this is just my opinion, that a lot of the media reporting is contributing very heavily to that. So I've picked up on this idea of going on a media diet and really controlling what media I consume. VLGA Connect is at the top of the list. The commercial freeware television news bulletins, they're gone. I don't know what you're doing, Catherine, but that's part of my approach. Oh, I think that's a good approach, Chris, and I've noticed that as well. I think um, some of the, the interviews that I certainly saw on mainstream news on Friday night and, and also on Saturday were really... Um, not helping the situation and really just reinforcing what we already know to be the case and perhaps reinforcing it unnecessarily so. So what I would say to our viewers is, yes, absolutely keep VLGA Connect newsroom and the governance update and, of course, all of our summer series programs right up there as must-see viewing because hopefully we won't dwell on, on those, um, those stories that aren't particularly constructive. So, Catherine, the Heart Awards, I think, are planning an outdoor event on Friday. Of course, as we record this, we're in the middle of the, we're actually exactly in the middle of the five-day lockdown. I guess you don't know for certain, but at this stage it would proceed as you planned? Yes, look, that's a really good news update, I would think. Um, we're going to make a call on that um, on Wednesday when we have a little bit more information. I think we should know what the government's intentions are. If we can't proceed with our outdoor event, we'll certainly convert that to a virtual event. And um, I think for those who've registered, it will be going ahead in some form or another, and we will confirm that on Wednesday, so stay tuned. And I must say also that applies to the VLGA's annual leadership development program, Fast Track. At the moment, we have uh, scheduled that to be a face-to-face -face event on the 5th of March. Of course, people do have um, find a face-to-face -face event um, of great value. But that said, I mean, all of us have been experiencing some really positive things with virtual platforms over the last 12 months. And we also can easily convert that and the high caliber panelists and guests we have lined up to an online event. We won't be making a call on that for a few days yet. Um, but again, stay tuned and, and we'll keep you updated. So, Catherine, let's have a look at some news uh, items that have caught our eye this week, part of the what we call the more newsy newsroom. Um, I was pleased to see the announcement of the chair and deputy chair of the Regional Cities Victoria Group and yeah. a good supporter of the VLGA and Greater Shepparton Council and Mayor Kim O'Keefe is the new chair of that group. The um, uh, the deputy chair has gone to the mayor of Greater Bendigo. Um, of course, one of the groups that advocate on behalf of, of groupings of councils around the state and really do a terrific uh, job keeping their needs at uh, the forefront. Congratulations to those two appointments and we look um, forward to working with them um, around many of the tables that we find ourselves together. Probably worth pointing out that uh, Regional Cities Victoria is a different group to rural Councils Victoria, uh, this uh, this has confused me in the past, but Regional Cities Victoria is the group of the 10 largest cities outside of Melbourne. So it's Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, Shepparton, 
Latrobe, Mildura, Wangaratta, Warrnambool and Wodonga. I think I've got them all. Then you've got the other RCV, which is what makes it um, uh, confusing. That's the Rural Councils of Victoria, who also really uh, work really hard for those smaller councils. So we wish them well. Absolutely, we do. And rural and regional uh, councils and cities uh, have some really um, specific needs, and I'm sure those two groups will represent them. Um, and you know, Chris, I'm not great with acronyms, let alone names, at the best of times. So I do apologise if I get any of them confused today. The annual community satisfaction survey has rolled around again, Catherine. This is the time of year when a select number of uh, residents will get a call to participate in a survey about how their local council is performing. So the word is out that that's happening um, imminently, as we would say often on the governance update. Absolutely. It's happening as we speak. And of course, that's part of local government Victoria's performance reporting framework. Um, there are a number of, of the 79 councils that, of course, participate in that. Other councils choose to engage their own consultant to conduct that satisfaction survey. But um, yes, for those of our viewers who may or may not be aware of it, keep an eye out. And if you have the opportunity to participate in a review of the performance of your council, please do so, because it's only through feedback, of course, that councils are able to improve on uh, and fine tune the services that they deliver to their communities. Another story that caught our eye this week, uh, obviously, while we're in lockdown, there's been this massive increase in capacity for public testing for COVID-19. Um, not news so much for, uh, for our purposes, but worth noting that a lot of councils are at the forefront there because they're providing venues uh, to, to allow those, uh, those great testing efforts to happen. Yes, and look, I mean, it's been consistent all through COVID. Uh, local government councils have been really at the forefront of delivering a lot of services and those that are specifically in response to COVID. So this is another example of that. And our hats do go off to those councils who are offering up their facilities to enable that increase uh, in testing to occur, uh, which of course we, we understand is essential if we're to get on top of this most recent outbreak. And also, um, I was really pleased to note that um, the first um, import or arrival of vaccines are, are, are now in Australia. I think um, that seems to have happened quite quickly and, and perhaps may well be in response to this latest outbreak in Victoria. Um, really interested to see when that will, I guess, land in those um, pharmacies and other providers of who will actually, who have, I believe, expressed an interest or through an expression of interest process um, to deliver the vaccine to community once, once it's um, ready to go. And perhaps one final story to comment on before a couple of classified notices, Catherine. Um, interesting article in The Age this past week, uh, commenting on the capacity of some councils to deliver their projects due to the loss of revenue from parking as uh, activities obviously uh, have been much less than normal, but in some cases, parking spaces turned over to outdoor dining. It's a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of story, isn't it? Look, it absolutely is. And I think it just re re reflects the complexity of the issues that councils are grappling with at the moment. Also the issues that, that local businesses are grappling with and just general members of the community. So I don't think we have the answer or the solution to this, but really, I think we just all have to recognise that it's not a simple environment that we're in. Councils will be considering the need to stimulate the local economy by allowing small businesses to operate. Also in a lockdown environment, the ability for people to move at least as freely as they can along the streets. Um, I mean, vehicle traffic is, is significantly reduced in periods of lockdown, um, but, I think it's not not one that we're going to solve today on Newsroom, Chris. That's absolutely right. But uh, good comments, just just the same, Catherine. Also, as a note, we did note this on the governance uh, update as well. Long-term CEO of Hume City Council, Dominic Isola, resigned in the last week after 13 years in the role. So we wish Dominic very well uh, with whatever is coming next uh, for him uh, and look out for that one to be added to the list of current CEO vacancies across uh, the state. Yes, there's a few at the moment. I, did I see eight? Or was that a Correct. figure? I, 
Yes, so there, there are a few at the moment. Uh, some other things quickly before we wrap up. Uh, I think we've mentioned hard awards, but the fast track program, which I also briefly touched on, we're still taking registrations for that. So whether it is face to face or via virtual means, there's a great lineup of panelists on that, talking all things about community engagement, what happens in the first 290 days of a new council term, uh, code of conduct and conflict resolution matters, because of course, a lot of councillors or councils are now uh, considering their code of conduct. And I think you may have touched on that in the governance update. There are, are a few councils who haven't actually achieved the two third um, sign off majority that they require. And that will have implications for the councillor group because that is such an important uh, guide for the council at the beginning of their term to, to guide and support the expected levels of conduct and behaviour uh, that they want for their councillor group. So it's really important that they do reach um, some sort of consensus and move forward from that point. Um, we also have, of course, our councillor code of conduct training that we're rolling out and also councillor induction training. So we're doing that with a number of um, councils throughout Victoria. Terrific. And uh, yeah. that's probably all we have time for this week, other than that I did read somewhere, Catherine, that you've got a new model for your induction training, looking at the, the elements of working with the media and social media. That sounds exciting. It is exciting. And we have engaged John Burgess from a PR company. Some people, some of our viewers might remember John. He was on our social media panel actually as part of our YCCC program, Your Community Country Council program. And I'm just trying to think of the name of his company, Little Rocket, uh, actually, that's it, I've got it. Um, and he brings with him a wealth of experience dealing, particularly um, also in political environments uh, as well. So looking forward to rolling out that module as part of our councillor induction program. We're also getting a lot of interest in the inclusion and diversity module. And um, that's causing some very robust discussions uh, within the councillor group. But of course, people must remember the VLGA doesn't set the legislative framework that requires councils to consider um, the components that fall within that uh, reconciliation, gender equality, diversity, inclusion module. But we do, as part of our support through the councillor induction program, support councils to consider and, I guess, work their way through that to reach a, a point where they're happy with um, not only the fact that they're meeting the legislative frameworks, but doing so in a way that works for their councillor group. Very good indeed. All right, thank you, Catherine. Um, to finish off, uh, learnings from lockdown this time around, I learned that Passata is uh, apparently a lockdown item. Made a dash when I heard it was an, well, actually it was not related to the announcement, but it was about the time it was announced, made a dash for some passata for dinner that evening, not a jar to be seen. And I thought, what on earth is happening here? But so, since people have told me, absolutely, it's one of the first things to go. Absolutely. And, and Chris, um, you might just hear some noise in the background, and that would be the uh, the garbage truck picking up the, uh, the garbage outside the front of my house. So that's um, one of those joys of working remotely. I don't know how you didn't catch up with the passata in the first lockdown. It was one of the first things along with a uh, tin tomato. Not something we normally buy. Usually there might be a bottle in the cupboard and you know you replace it every few months or so. Obviously some people do it more often than that. So yeah, there you go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Good to talk, uh, talk as always. And we'll see you again next week for the newsroom. And uh, coming up this week, uh, you'll be joining me for a very special interview on representative democracy. So stay tuned for that. Looking forward to that, Chris. Take care and we'll talk soon. Bye for now. See you again soon on VLGA Connect Summer Series. Mm -hmm.